It finally happened. Blake Snell is signing with the San Francisco Giants. We've been talking about it all offseason long. Foul territory breaking news. Scotty Braun, Eric Kratz, AJ Przinsky, and FT Senior Insider Ken Rosenthal. Two years, $62 million, and opt out after year one. Essentially a nice little pillow deal for the reigning Cy Young winner in the National League. Ken, what do you think about this one? Should the reigning Cy Young winner in the National League be getting a pillow deal? I don't think that was the idea initially. And yes, he'll have the opportunity to opt out after one year and get a bigger deal down the line. Of course, he'll have that. But at the same time, he has to prove himself all over again. What this really tells me, guys, is that the Giants have staged a coup of sorts this offseason. They got Matt Chapman for $54 million, Blake Snell for $62 million. If you had told me at the start of the offseason they would get those two players for a combined $116 million, you would have said, Ken, you are absolutely nuts, and I probably would have been. But that is the reality of the market. These were both Scott Boras clients, as was Cody Bellinger. All three have gotten deals that were seriously below expectations. That's the only way you can put it. And again, Boris can spin this and say, hey, we'll be back on the market next year. These guys will be back. We'll try again. It'll be better. I don't know that that's exactly how this should be judged. What the agents look at, what players look at, what teams look at are the sizes of the guarantees. That's how deals are judged. And the Giants here got a great deal on a pitcher that We'll see how he performs this season after all this. But at the same time, this is what they would have envisioned if they had their perfect scenario drawn up. Has a team ever started the season with number one and number two in the Cy Young voting from the previous season? Ooh, I don't know. Eric, I, know it's I, new, I know it's new news. I don't know. I imagine something like that might have happened, but... I don't know. I mean, obviously, you're talking about Blake Snell and Logan Webb, and it gives the Giants a terrific front of the rotation. Alex Cobb is ahead of schedule. He should be back, I don't know, sometime April or May. They're looking forward to Robbie Ray possibly rejoining them around the All-Star break. They've got Kyle Harrison, a top prospect. They've got Jordan Hicks transitioning to the rotation. Now the Giants suddenly look like a different kind of team. Are they the Dodgers? No, but you look at their rotation there, it looks a little bit better. And again, Cobb and Ray are coming. So with the additions of Chapman and Jorge Soler and Snell now and the other things that they have done, they're a lot more interesting than they have been. And that was one of the goals of their offseason, right? Yes, they were in on Otani and Yamamoto, but the main thing they had to do besides put a better product on the field, was put a more entertaining product on the field. Now, Blake Snell can be hard to watch at times, of course. He walks a zillion guys, but he's a great pitcher. And he will make them more interesting, more entertaining, more fun to watch. Ken, aftermath for other teams. You know, a couple days ago, you wrote with Chandler Rome in The Athletic about the Astros' pursuit of Blake Snell after the Jose Urquidy injury. And Yankee fans have been kind of begging for a little bit more help since Garrett Cole's down for a couple months. What do you think of those two teams particularly being out of it and any others that you think should have potentially be involved? I'll throw the Cubs out there as well as still a team that I thought would do more this offseason and they're running out of time. The Astros did not want to go to 30 million a year. And that was where they drew the line. I believe they made an offer in the 25 to $27 million range. Don't have that confirmed, but that's my informed speculation, put it that way. The Yankees, they always were problematic for Snell, though they made him an offer supposedly for over $100 million, maybe $150 million at some point in this process. Their problem is the luxury tax. And as Brendan Cuddy said right there, Two years and 62 million would have been actually 96.1 million for them with the tax. So at 110%, it makes the prices that much more difficult for a team like the Yankees who are over the highest luxury tax threshold. That said, Garrett Cole's out for what? One, two months, who knows? And while Rodon looks good and Cortez looks good and they've got Stroman, could the Yankees have used more starting pitching help? Absolutely. The Cubs, I don't believe, were ever in this mix. They made their big play for Bellinger, and they had Imanaga signed already. Should they have done more? You can certainly make a case they should have done more. You can certainly make a case a lot of teams 
should have done more. Blake Snell fits for any number of teams, but this has been an odd market. And it's been an odd market because of the RSN uncertainty and because certain teams, the Mets, the Padres, the Red Sox, have not been aggressive or as aggressive as they have been in recent years. Ken, what? I mean, this is a, you said it already, this is a Giants fan's dream come true because they got these guys and Farhan Zaidi played this perfectly. One question I have is we talked about this the other day with the Dylan Cease trade. Does it, I mean, the Padres are looking now like fourth worst team in their division behind the Dodgers, the Diamondbacks, the Giants. I mean, it's like, man, they made this trade and everyone was all excited. That was kind of what we questioned it. But, I mean, the Giants have to be two now probably, right, behind the Dodgers? Well, AJ, it's always hard to predict, right? But certainly what we can say is it's an extremely competitive division, except for the Rockies, who are the Rockies and will always be the Rockies, it seems. But, yes, the Giants have made themselves better. There's no question about that. How much better? We'll see. They still have a shortstop question. There's still some other issues with them as well. The Dodgers, they're loaded. We all know that. But their starting pitching is going to be pieced together probably all season long in one way or another. And the Diamondbacks, I like what they've done with Eduardo Rodriguez and with Goriel coming back and some of the other moves, Eugenio Suarez. We'll see if they can be a team on the rise. They should be. They're young for the most part. They should be getting better. But you never know if these teams will follow a linear path. And then, yes, you have the Padres. What I love about the Padres are their top four starters, right? They're really good. Beyond that, there are some obvious stars on this team, but there are also some obvious questions in the outfield and elsewhere. So we'll play the season out. Starts in what? A couple days and then the domestic openers in about 10 days, and it should be a lot of fun in that NL West. We talk a lot about what the team's outlook is going to be. We're, for Blake Snell, he's hoping he's going to be back on the market again because that means he had a really good year. Is he now the third best pitcher for next year's free agent market? Because that doesn't bode well for a big contract if he's going up against Burns and Max Freed. Well, we'll see how they all perform this year, right? And that will determine most likely how that all plays out. But, Eric, it's a great point. Granted, teams always need starting pitching, and they pay a premium for starting pitching. So you would expect, if all three enter the market healthy and in their usual form – that they will all do well. But we just saw an example of Blake Snell not doing well. And the one thing that's interesting about Boris's class next year, he's got a ton of guys. It's Burns, it's Alonzo, it's Juan Soto, it's Cody Bellinger, it's all of the opt-out guys. Chapman, he'll have to handle all that. He's done that in the past. He's done a good job of it, 2019 in particular. But at the same time, it's going to be crowded. And he's going to have to get a lot of guys paid. Hey, Ken, two more quick ones. One, you talked about this on Fair Territory. I encourage everyone to still check that out because it's relevant because with Snell, you spoke about the fact that he might not look the same in the beginning of the year. He's often a slow starter. How do you think this impacts him? And, you know, the Giants are not a team like the Dodgers that can say, hey, we're a playoff team regardless. Let's slow play this. They probably need every win they can get. And he did throw a sim game, right, of some sorts on Friday. He has been training at one of Boris's training institutes, and Boris has done this before with Kyle Loesch, with Dallas Keuchel, held guys out late or at least signed them late, and then they performed well. Those two pitchers certainly did, Loesch in 13, Keuchel in 19. Snell is, as you said, Scott, traditionally better in the second half than he is in the first. And as I said on Fair Territory and wrote today in The Athletic in our daily newsletter, a pitcher told me last week, a prominent pitcher who knows Snell fairly well, he's worried because Snell, like most of us, needs time to adapt to new surroundings. And it's going to take time to learn, as you guys know, a new catcher, a new pitching coach, a new manager, new teammates, a new city. The whole thing is different, and it's a rush job. So we'll see how this all plays out. And if he doesn't have a good year, for the Giants, at $31 million, losing a draft pick and not being able to get one back if he opts out, well, that's a problem. And it's a problem for Snell, of course, because he wants to opt out, I would imagine. He's 31 now. He's coming off a of Cy Young. This is the deal he got. He's going to want to do better. There's a lot of pressure on him, to be sure. 
Let's finish with this. How does it impact what's left? I mean, Jordan Montgomery is the name that's been linked to him all offseason long. Did he just kind of tank his market down as far as guaranteed dollars, just like Blake is not getting anywhere close to what he imagined? It's a little bit different because Montgomery did not get a qualifying offer and did not reject a qualifying offer. So he's not attached to a draft pick. Now, will it even matter at this point? I don't know. But we know teams that need him, the Yankees, the Rangers, but they're not willing to spend, it seems, because of their RSN uncertainty. Astros obviously have been in the market for starting pitching. They've got a question about Urquidy now. They've got other pitchers at various states of disrepair. Any number of teams could use Jordan Montgomery, just as any number of teams could have used Blake Snell. But this is where these guys are right now. And I would be surprised if Montgomery crushed a monster deal, if found a monster deal. It just doesn't seem likely at this point. Yep, makes sense. Ken, thank you so much for hopping on, and we'll talk to you down the road here, right? Thanks, guys. Thank you. Ken Rosenthal, FT Senior Insider, and also his own Fair Territory, which actually has a big announcement. You can get another edition of Fair Territory on this Thursday. So in a couple days, a live edition with the brand new co-host. Can't wait for that. All right. In the meantime, AJ, you see this, and what is your first thought about Blake Snell, if you could take yourself back like three, four months, and I told you, hey, AJ, Blake Snell's going to sign with the Giants on March 18th, of course, past 9 p.m. Eastern, because that's when everyone signs, for two years and $62 million. Uh, man, you crazy. <laughs> uh, because there's just no way you, 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 There's no way you would have thought that it would have gone this long. And there's also no way you would have thought that he only would have got 62 million because there was people talking about, you know, 150 to 200 plus range. And, and same with Chapman, right? And we'll see what Montgomery gets. We'll see what JD Martinez gets. But man, these numbers are not what people thought. And, you know, we've had this conversation with Ken. Like, is Boris losing? I don't want to say he's losing his touch, but man, you know, it's all his guys that are still left. And it seems like he's not a guy that North typically signs early. But the guys that signed early got the bag. The guys who waited have kind of got these one-year opt-out deals that are not what they were looking for. Hey, Kratz, do you think that Boris overplayed his hand? Let's be real. This guy has made a ton of money for his clients over the years. There are occasional times where he swings and misses. And that happened with Mike Moustakis years back, but then he recovered the next year. It's happened with others here and there who have had to accept what he termed pillow contracts for as many as we talk on this side there's usually like nine on the other side where you're like steven strasberg got what so i'm just saying for this current market should he have been more aggressive early on where there was more money on the table and i'll bring one example up to you i think the new york yankees had serious interest in him and i think they were very concerned about that luxury tax they've been pissed off about that for a while because it just means that they have to pay double money right now and that money goes to the teams that don't spend at least some of it does, right? And the big teams are sick of paying owners like Bob Nutting of the Pirates money so that they can just pocket it and run and be very mediocre. So they could have had Snell before they signed Stroman, and I think they would have done that if there was legit um, reports to the, what, six years, 150-ish that he got offered, and they might have said, eh, nah, he's worth more than that. So if it was, let's say it was five years, 120, would... Boris say, I'd rather have five years 120 of undervaluing my client or get what he's worth per year and then push it again to another year. That would be my question that I would have for Boris. Like, would you take the value per AAV that you think your player is worth and not take an undervalued contract? Hey, if only we had, missed. Yeah, if only we had players that played in MLB who – would talk about it at least been around situations like this so for example aj if you were blake snell and you got thrown out you know in the mid to low to mid 100s guaranteed wouldn't you be all over that i I mean if he knew about it i mean didn't the yankees allegedly offer five 150 that's what i'm saying i I, something in the in the 150 range five six whatever it was but here's the here's the real problem like we just talked about He's got to go prove himself again. Let's say he has a down year. Because remember, he's had the two great years, right? The two Cy Youngs. And then the other years are kind of, you know, eh, above above average, but not outstanding. 
So what happens if he goes out and has another average year and he hits the free agent mark? He's going to opt out and be like, well, I'm expecting $200 million. And a team might say, yeah, man, well, guess what, dude? You're not worth that pitcher. You were Cy Young last year. You only got 30. Uh, I guess, yeah. So I, I don't know. It's, it, it, it's a sticky predicament he's in because he didn't get what he was looking for this year. And I just, you know, I hope Blake Snell goes out and pitches great this year. I hope he goes out and deals and gets the contract he wants and deserves. But, man, it's just interesting that the guys that are left are all repped by the same guy. Would you not give him his 5%, AJ? Would you not give Boris his 5%? You have to. I mean, you have, you have to. What do you mean, would you not give it to him? I mean, the guy supposedly, if, if what we're hearing is true, that there's five years 150 out there, and you ended up with essentially 30, because every player is planning on having a good year, you essentially end up with 30. Don't you feel like, hey, like – where did where did we misstep here? Like, why did I not get at least what Aaron Nola got? I was the Cy Young Award where Aaron Nola got ex- got essentially extended. I mean, he was a free agent, but he got one seventy two. Like, what what are we what are we missing here? Well, you know, you could make the case if 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 you're buying. Bob Nightingale said the Yankees offered one fifty last month to Snell, pulled their offer, and declined to re-enter the sweepstakes. So the answer might be, hey, you're not getting past NOLA for whatever reason with the market. And some of it has to do with the fact that NOLA signed early. He signed with the team that already had him. And there are much less suitors involved this offseason than anticipated. The Nats and even the Tigers, teams like that, are still kind of sitting on the sidelines. The Red Sox were total fakers. The Cubs were kind of chill. Like they, they weren't going nuts. Right, the Mets are sitting it out for the most part this off season. There's a lot of that, except for obviously Yamamoto, which that was a different sweepstakes. It's just a product of the marketplace. So hey, Blake, 150. That's probably the best you're going to get. It's 25 less than Nola, but the guarantee is pretty close. What do you say? And whether it was him and or Boris, they said, Nah, we're going to hold out and think that we should get more. Right? That must have been the case if that was the offer put out there. I hope. I hope it's Snell that said no. Because he might just go out and have like a 0.9 ERA this year. <laughs> I mean, who, who's to say he didn't figure something out in the set in the last 20 games? Like, I don't know that he was. Yeah, he's on a heater, but what if he just committed to something that was, you know, he was non-committal to? Like, hey, I just want to be middle middle with my pitches and see what happens. Or, hey, I don't really care. I'm just going to keep gripping and ripping these things. And if guys walk, they walk. I'm going to punch out the world. Like, look, he, he, he didn't have – he has 20 more innings than any of the pitchers on the Dodgers staff. In their career highs, he had 180 innings last year. It's not like he's, he's just a five-and-dive guy because, you know, the whole, the whole inning stuff, it's relative now. Like, we're not talking about 200-inning guys besides Wheeler, Nola, Burns, Logan Webb. And, Logan, and he doesn't need to be that with Logan Webb there. Logan Webb's going to go seven. Hey, two of my guys in the bullpen are fresh. Blake, go get you 10 punchies and, and hit AJ's over, please. And, and AJ, Kratz is right. I mean, we spoke about this when we were breaking down the pitcher himself, Blake Snell, and why he won the Cy Young. And do we buy what he was selling in the next four months of the season after a slow-ish start? And he was by far the best pitcher in baseball during that time period. He said, my slider was trash. I learned how to mix my pitches. Once my slider came back, Cy Young. And guess what? The numbers point to that. So I can buy some of that. I mean, can can a dude elevate his game at a later age as a pitcher? Do we not see that all the time from pitchers? He's not that old. He's 30 30 years old. Yeah. Right? So I mean, yeah, but and he made a tweak. I mean, he figured out how to mix his pitches and found the right. And he doesn't give in. That's what – listen, that's what Scott Boris was selling. You should work for Scott Boris, Scott Braun, because what you just said is exactly what Scott Boris was selling to every team. And guess what? There wasn't a team buying, though. They, they weren't buying it. They, they're like, you're going to have to show me, and you now he's going to have to do it again. So, listen, I, I, listen, I, I think Blake Snell's a great pitcher. I think he deserves to get paid way more than this. But the market was what the market is. Same with Jordan Montgomery. Same with Matt Chavin. Same with Cody Bellinger. Same with a lot of guys. It just sucks. I mean, it's just a bad time 
sometimes the, the year matters more. It's like mm. the Hall of Fame, right? What year do you go on the ballot, right? And who's coming on with you and who's, who's a holdover on the Hall of Fame, whether you make it to a second year or not? Well, guess what? It just happened to be a bad year. Teams are worried about the luxury tax. And, oh, yeah, you had two Japanese superstars on the thing, and the one big market team that bids and really wants to spend got them both. And then after that, they were like, yeah, we don't need another starting pitcher. Maybe they do, but they were like, yeah, we got Otani, we got Yamamoto, we got Teoscar Hernandez, we got these guys, we re-signed Jason Hayward, right? So they are like, okay, we're not in on you guys. And then the team, that every, the two teams everyone was looking at, the Red Sox and the Cubs were like, yeah, we're not spending this year. So it was just a bad year to be on the market. And sometimes it just happens like that. Yeah, and my thing also, Kratz, is it has just as much to do with the market as it has to do with the pitcher, you know? Like, do we really know if some teams internally met up and said, eh, you know, we, we're not sure about this guy? Or was it, hey, we are not spending like that this offseason? Or, like we mentioned, it's the Yankees. Hey, we made our offer. We gave that some of that money to someone else, and now we're chilling, right? I mean, what's the team that everyone, not everyone, what's the team that some people linked him to geographically that I said was absolute trash from the day Seattle. that it was thrown out there? He's from I Seattle. I even said it because cool. it was That's from great. his he's mouth. He's from Seattle. I know, but he's from Seattle. I understand. He wants to go there, Kratz, but he's from Seattle. The Mariners have a sick pitching staff, and they are kind of broke. They cut their payroll this offseason during their prime winning window. And the one part I'll agree on the ownership side, because I don't agree with anything else they've done, the one part I'll agree is if you're going to allocate cash and you're the Mariners, it should be on offense, right? The starting pitching is the one spot where they're in pretty damn good shape compared to almost any other starting staff. So if you were going to shell out three plus million dollars, it should have been trading for someone like Juan Soto or maybe getting involved in the Cody Bellinger sweepstakes or trying to wow the White Sox with a pitching prospect and get a Luis Robert, right? That is where the money should have been allocated. They chose to kind of just dance around and pick up some pieces and reshuffle the deck, whatever you call it. So it's teams like that where during the season you expected them to be aggressive. They cut their luxury tax payroll by $20 million. So I think a lot of this just has to do with the market. But couldn't the same be said about the Giants before they made these moves? The Giants needed to upgrade their offense. And instead, they're like, screw that. This place sucks to hit. We have a couple guys. We are going to double and triple down now on our defense and pitching. They went and got Son of the Wind. They got Matt Chapman. They got, eh, they might have a hole at shortstop, but I think they're going to find somebody there. They have one of the better defensive catchers behind the dish in Bailey. They have now, they have a possibility of having three Cy Young since in the last four seasons, three Cy Young Award winners, not finalists, winners in their rotation. I get it. It's after July. I'm under, actually, no, Logan Webb didn't win a Cy Young. Never mind. But you have Logan Webb, Robbie Ray, and Blake Snell going into a playoff series. Good luck. All you have to do is score two or three runs. Yeah, Webb finished in second last year for the Cy. There's Susan Slusser. I've confirmed the Snell signing. It includes a $17 million signing bonus payable June 2026, $15 million salary in 2024. You know, messing around oh, with books to love that. make it all nice. Yeah. Is that like a state tax thing? So that he gets that money in Washington? I mean, I think it would just be – I don't know how the signing bonuses work for baseball. I, I don't know. I know how it works to an extent. Like some of it – a lot of it has to do with, with taxes because I think you can get that bonus when you're in a certain state. I don't know. Like That's your residency? Me. Yeah. I know that's worked for some other players, even with extensions Residency. too, where they've after. Yeah. I used to always try to get a signing bonus because I was in Florida and it, they'd play it. They'd pay it to me in Florida and I'd get no taxes on it. Real? Right. Like so that, you, you would get mm -hmm. that. So there yeah. you go. But that's for it. Sometimes teams would do it. Sometimes they wouldn't, but most of the time they would because they can pay it up front and it's one big lump sum. And then during the season, they just, you get paid less, but it was great for me. Normally signing bonuses, I always thought signing bonuses, guys that told me they got them, they would get them in December of the year that they signed. Am I wrong on that? Because his is in January. You got yours up front. Yeah. 
That's why it's a signing bonus. I'd have taken the whole. I'd have taken the whole signing bonus, and I've been like, I'm, I'm only making the minimum in the, in the big leagues. Yeah, but teams wouldn't do that. Teams, teams are smarter than that. All right, let's finish with this. NL West, rank it. We've been having fun with this, but when you caught us for our Dylan Cease breaking news show the other day, we were like, maybe the Padres are a third place team. No, you're shaking your head. I'm Go saying back to the now. Show with Todd, Todd made fun of me. He made a big, he made a big note on his pad. He goes, Eric thinks the Giants are. And our NL West champs. I'm like, no, I don't think they're NL West champs. I think it's still the Dodgers. But I, I really thought even with the cease thing, I thought it was Dodgers, Giants, Diamondbacks, Padres, and just just below the Padres. Actually, no, just below the A's, the Rockies. Hmm? AJ. I'm trying to figure out how the A's got involved, but okay. Just, um, just the worst, just one of the worst teams. I know they're not in the NL West. Oh, um, I'm getting rankings in the chat right now. Adam said Dodgers, Giants, Diamondbacks, Padres. Got Craig going Dodgers, that. Diamondbacks, Padres, Giants. Thank you, Roger. Roger, this, this is why this is why people were kind of killing me for the Dylan Cease question. But are are the Padres better? With I mean, listen, Dylan Cease is a great pitcher, but. Are they better than any of the other three teams in the division? That was what I asked Ken, uh, especially after the Giants go out and get Blake Snell. Are they better? I mean, are they a playoff team? Are they a team that can afford – I know they didn't give up any of their top three prospects, but are they a team that can go out and give up who they gave up in order to get a guy like Dylan Cease as their third starter and make a run in this division and in this league in general? Because if you look at it, the Braves and Phillies, you can almost pencil them in unless something crazy happens, right? There's a central team that has to go in. So that leaves three teams. Someone's missing out between Dodgers, Giants, Padres, Diamondbacks. Which one's it going to be? Diamondbacks. Yeah? Why do you think so? A lot had to go right for them. I think they have to. What series hangover? They did a lot this offseason, though. I mean, they did a lot me, of great stuff. Guys, for me – if there was a chance that Snell was going to go to the Astros or the Yankees, and now he ends up in the National League West, NL Central teams are screwed. That's what I'm thinking. There's oh, one yeah. team coming out of the NL Central right now. At least that's what it looks like on paper. Yeah. That's tough. I mean, Braves and Phillies are super strong. You have four pretty good-looking teams right now in the NL West, right? And you're probably only going to get three out of that. And then the NL Central doesn't get anything. Besides their division winner, right? I just filled up three wild card teams: two from the West, one from the East, and good luck to the Central. And we didn't even mention Marlins made the playoffs last year. We didn't talk about them. We didn't talk about the Mets, right? We didn't talk about what was it? Cubs, Reds, Brewers in the Central. Dude, one look at the Mets rotation compared to say I, I the know, I'm just saying. rotation or the Padres rotation. But yeah, you're right. I'm just saying, like, look at who's got a chance to go to the playoffs. There's going to be a lot of pissed off fan bases and a lot of pissed off people. Are you going with the Diamondbacks making the playoffs there, Scotty Too Hotty? I don't want to answer. I'm just, I'm just rocking my cell shirt. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So who am I kicking out? Is that what you're asking? That's, that's the inevitable question. Kicking out the Padres. Braves, Phillies, Reds, or whatever in the Central. And we'll do all these predictions. Obviously, we're on every day on FT. We'll, we'll get to all these before the season starts. And then NL West, Dodgers, Diamondbacks, Giants. Boom, there does you go. This, does this close the gap on the Dodgers – lead in the nl west does this no, even like I mean, put a dent in it the lineups are not close but you could make a case for a better more trustworthy starting rotation with san francisco right now and man i like what's coming back for them later on too i think robbie ray could come on strong in august and september alex cobb should be back in a month or two 
a good looking rotation. Jordan Hicks can hold things down at least for a little, and then maybe you move him to the bullpen in the second half of the year. Dude, there's stuff in that rotation. This is what San Francisco needed. They had two starters by the end of last year, and they were playing footsie with the rest of them. So I'm a big fan of what they're selling here. Hey, we'll talk much more about this on FT tomorrow. AJ's got to get some rest. We're going to be at Orioles camp live talking to some of their young players. Come on, wake up, wake up. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us on this little breaking news way, edition of FT. Yes? By the way, can we, like, you guys already talked about it, but can we can we please, please get someone to sign in the middle of the day for once? No, every signing has to be past 9 o'clock Eastern time, okay? Or West somebody Coast. to get traded? Somebody to nope. get tra- I know Boris is on the West Coast, but can we get somebody to get traded in the middle of the day, please? Boris does his deals at 6 o'clock West Coast time. Uh, we have FT every day, 11 a.m. Eastern time until the day before opening day. Then we're back to our one o'clock time live every single day on YouTube and Padres Dodgers. We will be live at like 8 30, 9 o'clock in the morning for a post game show. We're hustling every day. Thanks to Ken Rosenthal for joining us earlier. Scroll back to watch the beginning of this if you want to see Ken's thoughts and we'll see everyone tomorrow.